Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin shortly. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the session will now begin. Please take your seats. Technological innovation is a two-edged sword. It improves productivity and welfare across the globe, but it can also be job-destroying and disruptive in many ways in the short run. Over long periods, technological innovation that takes the form of automation replaces less skilled workers with machines and can contribute to persistent and widening income inequality. Extracting the large benefits of technological innovation while mitigating its disruptive effects constitutes one of the great policy challenges of our time. What major forms of technological advance should we expect over the next 20 years? What effects are likely on welfare and inequality? What should governments do to improve the effects of technological change, especially on the less privileged? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our moderator for the Technology, Welfare and Inequality session, Manager of Social Strategy at NBC-owned television stations, Sarah Glover. Everyone, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone awake? Yes. I'm excited to join you uh, here at the Atlantic Dialogues. It's a wonderful time and a really engaging conversation this morning with some fabulous uh, panelists. First, I would like to call to the stage Bruno Baccara. He is the founder of Social Analytic Dialogue. Bruno. And then next, Serene Gayup Diop. He is the Minister Advisor to the President of the Republic of the Mayor of Sandiara of Senegal. Good to see you. Yes, you may sit. And then next, Sanjoy Josie, Chairman Observer Research Foundation of the ORF. And then last, Maria Teresa Fernandez de la Vega, President Council of State of Spain. President, Woman for Africa Foundation. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is a really, really, really important conversation, is it not? Technology is certainly the future from the cell phones and our uh, mobile devices and iPads that we use every day just to function. Um, and we're going to unpack how technology impacts, not just today and the way that we communicate, but the future. And not only technology as a science, but technology as a thing that mobilizes communities and countries and policy. Um, and I thought we could just jump right in. Um, and we're going to talk, we're going to first unpack the elements of psychosocial and how 
psychology and sociology and thinking can actually impact Perfect. technology. Thank so you. I'd like for you to maybe explain to us <coughs> a little bit about psychosocial technology. What is that? And how does that impact um, technology today and into the future? Sure. So I'm first going to make um, <coughs> a few general points about what it means to think from a psychosocial perspective. Anything that provides a link between members of a society, whether it's an exogenous shock, a policy, or in this case, technology, calls for an analysis, what I call above the surface and below the surface. What's the surface? The surface is what separates the social conscious, that's usually where policymakers, politicians are, that's where the media are, that's where in an illusion, all the demonstration and dialogue in a society takes place. And then below the surface is the hidden. It's the psychosocial aspects, some unconscious, some still conscious. This is where, in many ways, the action is. Why? Because this is unknown, and this is often forgotten. Of course, a big mistake would be to only be below the surface. In other words, only think about psychosocial aspects. The same way, a mistake that I think has been costly up until now has been to systemically, uh, mm. systematically approach policies or dialogue from a position of above the surface. So now, in my case, we're going to try to go below the surface. In other words, think psychosocially. Think psychosocially is not enough. It also needs to be done, since we're talking about a society, from a systems dynamic perspective in other words, uh, general equilibrium. So I'm going to make a small point, and then I'm going to jump into technology, and only have two points on technology. The first point, which uh, may seem abstract, is I do not believe we can approach anything unless we're comfortable, unless we willingly enter what I call the position, the state of not knowing. Often, in particular in policy circles, we assume or we position ourselves as if we knew, as if we had the answer. But time and time tells, usually we do not because there are so many uncertainties. Now, by positioning ourselves as I have an answer or I have the answer, it also implies that whoever may be across the table and may disagree doesn't have the answer. Whereas if we enter, if we adopt a state of not knowing, which is something very common in psychoanalytic session, then we already start the debate, we already start asking questions as if nobody knew. The implication is that there is, by definition, an will be empathetic listening, willingness to hear the other side because we position ourselves as if, although we may believe that we know, as if nobody knew. So that's the position of not knowing. I believe it's absolutely crucial in almost anything we do. It's also a position of humbleness. So now let me jump into technology. Point one, that's mostly social media. Parenthesis, I do a lot of work, obviously, on psychosocial issues, including uh, in Morocco. I haven't really worked, of course, I'm impacted by it every day, on technology per se. So if you want, I'm putting myself in that not knowing state. So point one, technology, in particular social media, increases the demand, increases the wish for narcissistic gratification. Mm -hmm. We all know this, or we all probably felt this, and this is something I've heard one of the groups I work with in Morocco is a school of quarters, something, a very impressive school called 1337, a member of School 42, and they've certainly expressed that point. Now, to wish uh, narcissistic gratification, one would say, so what? The problem is when there is an increased demand for narcissist gratification, it's likely that there'll be an increased propensity for, trans for relationship between individuals, relationship between individual and organization, and even a relationship between individuals and the state, if not actually the entire planet, parenthesis, that's climate change, to be narcissistically driven to be, uh, if you want, when there are, when transactions are narcissistically driven, the objects of narcissistic gratification is not recognized as a full object. It's only an object to be used for one's pleasure. 
when you have that kind of state, you tend to have perverse societal dynamics, uh, corruption, and so on. So I believe technology is a jump in an unknown that's going to dramatically or is dramatically altering the wish for narcissistic gratification and therefore the inability to consider the other as a true object, point one. Point two, what's happening in the world today? In a nutshell, if I only had two words to characterize my environment, I would say meaninglessness and futurelessness. Now, we've been there before, so it's not like suddenly today we say, oh my God, it's meaningless and it's futurelessness. No. During the first industrial revolution, and I've looked at a lot of uh, history reports and how families were broken and <clears throat> increased in uh, all type of psychological disorder, there's really a feeling at the time, at least what's being reported now, of the death of a way of life. So that's not new. We've been there, we're back, we're here, in the death of a way of life. But something is drastically different. For the first time, and including, of course, because of technology, we're very integrated, all information is shared. Anything that happens or shock somewhere has the ability to be transmitted, usually very fast, somewhere else. We face, and there's a lot of talk now about it, something called climate change, global warming. In other words, there's something that it's very hard to define. It's really an annihilation anxiety. And that's changed drastically because such an anxiety it's going to immediately call for a response. That response is called denial. Remember, with general equilibrium, social system, so not denial for one person, collusive denial. So now we're in a society where we need to protect ourselves from a risk that we can't really quantify. And as a result of collusive denial, this amplifies again the perverse dynamics where you have accomplices and you try to kind of shield yourself. Where does technology come in? comes back as a helper. Technology can also be a defense, an illusion. What's the anxiety of that leads to collusive denial? It's, I do not know. There's something I do not know, something so frightening that I risk losing omnipotence. Now, in a psychoanalytic word, when you lose world, when you lose omnipotence, think of the young baby, things go really wrong. Now, the level of the baby is just going to be a lot of crying. At a level of a large group or the entire planet losing omnipotence, it's not going to look like a little bit of crying. It's like look something far uglier and part of what we see today. So that loss of omnipotence will be accompanied by all kinds of defense. What's the defense? I don't know. I'm terrified. I lose my omnipotence. I need to find something which is going to conclude I know. Technology in part. Of course, it has a lot of the solutions to what we're facing. Can be that something can be used defensively as an illusion to restore omnipotence. And I'll close with a last and concluding point, because in a, also the session description, there was a link, which may not be clear. Maybe that link was because I was one of the speakers. What's happening worldwide? Suddenly, everybody is in the street. They make a lot of noise. And what used to be only uh, Arab Spring, what people thought, maybe it's going to be Arab Spring 2.0. Now it's Worldwide 2.0. So Worldwide 2.0 is a little bit scarier. And my belief in a nutshell of what's happening, we talked about narcissistic denial, restoring omnipotence. And that's the anxiety of not knowing. I think right now what's happening is what I call an anxiety of not belonging. So there is, and that really explains what's happening in the world, there's a building of what I call the narcissistic fortress, where those that belong can get in. Belonging, so the feeling of omnipotence, of validation, is validated by those that are not in. Exclusion is fundamental to restoring omnipotence. Now, if you're excluded, how do you think it's going to feel? If you want the answer, go in, go in Bogota, go in uh, Beirut, go in Santiago. So in a nutshell, to conclude, I believe that technology has a propensity to increase the use of one another as narcissistic object, to be used defensively as, a illusion to, as an elusive tool to restore omnipotence, and one of the con conclusions may be some of the fra fractions that we see today, 
and the result, uh, resulting violence. Thank you. Thank you. That was such an important, insightful um, journey that you just took us on. Because I think so often when we have these conversations around technology, we immediately jump in to talk about what that is specifically, AI, artificial intelligence, um, you know, whether it be the actual devices that we use or the platforms that we're using to communicate our messages, such as social media. So thank you for taking you. us um, on to start this journey to talk about us as people. Right, And so how we as people uh, manage technology is just as important as the technology and Thank also you. how we respond okay. to it and this pool of anxiety that technology can bring, um, not just about how to use technology and if you have the capacity to understand technology, but that you are, no matter which way you turn, it is going to have an impact on you and it oh. can actually make you anxious. Um, which is which is not always a good thing. So technology is good and bad, is it Correct. not? Yes. yes. So the the title of our panel, interestingly, technology, welfare, and inequality. So you were able to to tap welfare in a very unique and boisterous way. Um, and we have this esteemed panel up here with a great conversation. So I wanted to move then into the science of technology. And Mr. Dio, you can give us some insights on the science of how technology is impacting um, our society today, um, in agriculture, and in, in economy, in politics. Um, give us a little bit of insight how technology is, is working for the good of, of communities and how science is, is at that intersection. Thank you very much. I uh, um, would like to, first of all, uh, congratulate uh, people from the uh, Atlantic Dialogue uh, to put together all these different experts, and uh, this is really a very important happening in Africa. Uh, as a scientist, actually, uh, I see uh, technology as opp opportunity. If you remember the, the revolution, industrial revolution, all the countries uh, before the industrial revolution were at the same level of development. It's only after that in the years uh, 19, uh, 1905 that you can see development of Europe going very high, uh, much higher than the development from the other part of the world. And today, thanks to technology, China had uh, today reached uh, over, overpassed even the United States of America. And this will continue. So for me, uh, the science, this is more uh, opportunity. If you look at the impact of science, the impact of uh, biology, biotechnology in agriculture. It was tremendous. Today we know the genes that are, uh, are, are influencing uh, yield today. We know the genes that are influencing protein content in plant, in, in beans. We know today how to grow milk production uh, from uh, 20 liters to 40, 50 liters today because we know those genes. Today in gene therapy, you can also heal a lot of disease today. This is increasing. Uh, uh, in genetics, we know today what influences all these diseases, cancer, uh, the disease of um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, all these type of disease today, we know how they are explained today. We know also that in seeds technology, how uh, from seed you can increase really yield by 10 times just because of we know how to create new seeds, particularly for Africa, in the field of cereals, in the field of uh, also uh, animal uh, and uh, breeding. And this is very important for us because in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, remember that the problem is still food availability, food quality, yep. nutrition, uh, under nutrition. And this, for me, we must always, when we are in this forum, think about the two sides of technology. The one today that is more uh, on IT technology, uh, on robot technology, uh, artificial intelligence that is growing, which is a very good thing. It can have impact on employment, but for me, this is the world, the world must evolve from technology, influenced by technology. But from uh, the developing world, it's different. It's opportunity, actually. For example, when I come back to, uh, to, to, to Senegal, uh, to Rwanda, today we see uh, rob uh, things like uh, drones helping, uh, actually, uh, to know what is the, the level of the need of water for irrigation. Uh, we know how uh, with, rob with uh, drones you can also deliver uh, some uh, fertilizer, you can deliver some uh, 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 part for, for, for a car, for a tractor. So this is becoming more and more important. Uh, the other thing that is very important also we have seen in Kenya, in Senegal, in Nigeria, is the IT, uh, the telephone cellular, the airtime, and also the inclusion, financial inclusion because of cell phones. Today from the cell phone you can see 
thousands of young people, I would say even 100,000 of young people having employment because today they use the technology to uh, uh, transfer money, they use the technology to have also uh, call centers, to work in call centers, and this is very, very uh, important. And also the circular economy. I think technology is also a unique um, uh, tool for uh, financial inclusion for women. And this is very important also in, in, in Africa, where today banking can be done just from a cell phone for women selling fish, selling uh, fruit, selling whatever. Today you can also just from your cell phone uh, know what, you, where, what is the best price, where you can have the best price for, for your, 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 your fish, for your uh, raw material, for your vegetables and so on. Then I think this is the, the reason why we, we need actually to develop a technology. I think one of the best ways where Africa is really lacking behind is on knowledge, mm -hmm. on science and technology. That's why I, I, I think rather than giving, uh, assisting Africa to in, in, in uh, food uh, programs, in uh, financial programs, the best way to help Africa actually is to have access to science, access to technology, access to education for women, for young people in the rural area and, and so on. I would also uh, just um, uh, uh, talk about the influence on technology, uh, of technology on, on, on welfare. You, uh, this is also another area where actually we need to uh, reinforce all by all means the development of technology in, in, uh, in the developing world. Because this has a direct impact on social being, on well-being, where people increase their, their uh, overall income, their home income. And this is very important because as soon as uh, you, people master technology, as soon as they uh, can uh, have it as a tool, you can see the, in the income increasing. It means the, the social needs uh, will be uh, actually uh, just be uh, increasing as well, but at the same time, they are, they are becoming autonomous. And this is the reason why in, in Senegal, we have a big program we call uh, uh, Plan Senegal Emergent, which has uh, three axes. One is the industrial uh, restructuration of the economy. It's very important that we look at uh, how we can really, using technology, develop agriculture, industry, infrastructure, IT, uh, a plan for uh, digitalization. We had another axis we call human capital, which is how to develop knowledge, how to develop people with new knowledge, engineers, the medical doctors, and so on, how we can really make sure that our, our state, African government, invests a lot in universities, in uh, vocational training, uh, in uh, highly uh, oriented uh, economy oriented education. Uh, so this is really our second axe. And now the, the third one, which is very important, is really talking about uh, governance, about good governance and social inclusion. And we had big program that we are testing. One is called the PUDC, where really we would like mm -hmm. to make sure that everything is available uh, for to really uh, improve the social welfare in, uh, in the different uh, part of the areas. And uh, once again, technology to have clean water is used. Technology to have fast roads, uh, to have access to very uh, remote areas is also used. And that's the reason why I think there's a very close relationship between uh, the impact technology today as it is in all the field, agriculture, industry, uh, medical field, and uh, plant science, uh, medical science, and so on, and also the, the, the welfare. And uh, I will uh, also just um, uh, talk about how technology can also reduce inequality. In, in, uh, in uh, many countries in the world, we have seen that uh, access to technology immediately can help to reduce uh, poverty. Because uh, as soon as you start having technology, it means that your productivity as human is just increasing. It can go very fast, 10 times, 20 times, because in uh, eight hours, you can do more than what you used to uh, do. In, in, and the typical example I'm using always is agriculture, working time. Today in agriculture, we're working uh, in Africa, uh, around 400 hours per, uh, per, uh, per year instead of 2,000 hours per year. And this is mainly due to the fact that we don't master the technology of water, of boreholes, of irrigation. So as, as soon as we master the technology of irrigation, it means that we're going to be able to work out of the rainy season, work eight hours, eight months more, 1,400 1, uh, hours more, on, for eight million people in Senegal, this just 
can bring $8 billion just in, in the GDP of a country like Senegal or Mali. So uh, I, I believe that uh, the, the, the technology, once again, in uh, the field of uh, information technology, has also a bright future. I think uh, we all know uh, what's up, what that this money uh, uh, digitalization is coming from Kenya. It has been developed in Kenya a lot, and we can see the impact in terms of employment. So all the, uh, the, the problems we're facing in Africa, diseases, uh, unemployment, poverty, undernutrition, one of the solutions actually is really mastering the technology and uh, is going uh, back to uh, the, uh, the fundamentals, which is access, universal access to, to technology. One cop, of course, can have a fear on uh, what will happen if uh, people are replaced by robots. Uh, what will happen if intelligence develop uh, to, to make more uh, occupy or replace people in the... But for me, this is not really the right uh, question. The right question is how governance can be equilibrate. We as ministers, as state uh, uh, presidents or members, uh, parliament, uh, members of the parliament, we must now just try to recalibrate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the impact of technology. Of course, it can favor maybe the white collars, it can favor CEOs and so on, but we must really re uh, how, see how we can balance it by uh, taxes, by having very strong welfare program for the poor people. I can see that also in, in Europe, in, in Boston, in uh, Latin America, everywhere. Uh, you hear these inequalities. But you cannot uh, really talk about capitalism without inequality. It goes together. But I think uh, it's up now to, to governance, decision makers like us, to make sure that we, uh, we boost technology, we invest a lot on it, and I think that should be the priority in Africa. We must put billions of dollars to build school, to build the university, to equip our laboratories with the latest technology in IT, in mechanic, in agriculture, in bio, bioscience, and so on. But at the same time, make sure that it is used by the wide uh, part of the population, that the impact of the science uh, uh, on the population is really very, very positive. So I think uh, this is really what I was... Uh, I wanted just to uh, talk about uh, as an introduction, and I believe uh, that uh, if you don't uh, pay attention to inequality, this can be a big problem. I can just give three examples. First of all, it was South Africa, where uh, just because of uh, access to technology, access to wealth, create this, um, yes. this year. And the others was, of course, Tunisia, where we saw that also when uh, technology and wealth is not very well shared, this becomes also a big problem. Yes. We have seen that in Egypt and many other countries. So. So this is really the reason why uh, I think the three uh, key words here, technology, welfare, and inequality, uh, uh, must really draw our attention uh, for all of us, scientists, policymakers, all the people really who are involved in development for today and tomorrow, we must really pay attention to that. And including now the United States, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, I think we need to see where do we put, put the money. And I, I must say that if I had to take a decision, I would put 30 to 40 percent of the wealth today in, uh, in education, in mastering technology, in mastering science, in making sure that oh, in all the parts of the world, Asia, Africa, and so on, we, can, we have a, a technology available and used with a positive impact on people's life. This was an excellent um, summary how technology impacts every facet of life and uh, really appreciate that, that clear application. Um, you would be a phenomenal and are a phenomenal um, reasonable conscious of why investment is needed. So it's interesting that you ended on that note because as you were speaking, um, that's immediately what I thought about is how important governance is to this conversation and the investment in technology. Um, so thank you for that overview. And it's actually a terrific segue to the welfare um, that we're gonna get a little bit further in and talking about work, right? And how technology not only impacts work, but is at the core of productivity. And if you could talk a little bit then now, um, you know, Sanji, about the the impact of productivity, the impact of work, and how technology is impacting us now favorably, and what that looks like heading into the future. Uh, thank you. It's always been a pleasure being at the Atlantic Dialogue just because of the sheer diversity of debate uh, that this platform brings. Uh, I've really enjoyed the comments of my predecessors, and I'd like to take on from both what Bruno said and what the minister said. Uh, let, let me first start with the idea of collusive denial collusive denial which society gets into. I come from a country which in the 1970s, this comes to issues of governance also, which the minister spoke about, 
a country which in the 1970s set up a parliamentary committee to go into the issue of computerization. And the recommendation was that computers are job destroying, they should not be introduced, and therefore India said no to IBM, India said no to every technology change which computers would bring, and the result was that we lost about 20 years in the process. Then we started to play catch up. And then when we started to play catch up, within five years, India transformed the country which said no to computers, transformed itself into a country which then came to be known as the IT power, the information technology power of the world. It came to be named, known as the Info Nation. Now that is a whole story as to how India grew. And the dramatic story about India, the paradox about India's growth was that in this process of growth, <clears throat> India completely skipped for about 10, 10 years the cycle of export-led manufacturing growth, which the rest of the developing world, including countries like Japan, the Asian Tigers, and China had ridden to prosperity. 63% of India's growth came from IT-enabled technology services. That is the, during the miracle years when India was growing very fast. Now people like talking about the coming of the fourth industrial revolution. Industrial revolutions don't happen, they just creep upon us. In many ways, many of the changes which are foreseen in the fourth industrial revolution have already been with us for many, many years. Uh, if I look at 2012 in India, in 2012, a major strike broke out in the Suzuki manufacturing plant, which goes under the name of Maruti in India, at the Suzuki manufacturing plant. It was a very violent strike. Uh, one manager got lynched and killed. <coughs> Unfortunate incident, but the response was that car makers in India then started automating their supply chains and started to move to targets, Ford, Volkswagen, Suzuki, they all went into a production cycle, they changed assembly lines to make them 99% more automated. Hmm. Yes, that destroyed jobs. But then India, we, we see it very, very clearly that as we move into the future, see what, what the third industrial revolution has been doing is that the entire, uh, the, it, it, it created the global value chains, the global value chains of manufacturing. What happened in the global value chains was that jobs, Production cycles got broken up, disaggregated into small bits of components. And countries which had the comparative advantage in each section of the value chain started entering there because they started, some started manufacturing, some started design processes, and communications enabled the integration, transportation, and entire design structure and marketing of these throughout these global value chains into the best markets in the world. Now today, the actual competition amongst nations is fundamentally about where do countries position themselves in these global value chains, because they are being transformed again. Yes, they are partly being transformed because of trade wars, but they are also being transformed because of fundamental differences taking place in the nature of manufacturing. Manufacturing itself is changing. In the world of the future, manufacturing does not really become, uh, remain manufacturing. Most of the manufacturing, as we know it, is done, is done automatically. What manufacturing fundamentally becomes a service. If, uh, when you move on to additive manufacturing, other kinds of services. So countries like India start seeing a certain opportunity, which countries which grew in the, on the services sector, see a certain opportunity where they can use knowledge power to get into the new disrupted global chains which are now going to be created as a result of the changes taking place in, 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 in the world of uh, manufacturing. But what does this do? What it also does, what we've been seeing over the last few years as global value chains uh, wrote themselves out, we saw economic inequality between nations actually decrease. New countries came out, they started emerging, the income gap started closing between nations. But unfortunately, within nations, within nations, inequality started increasing. And it is the result of increasing inequality within the nations that has led to the kind of tumult you see across the world. 
where you're seeing disruption in the youth out in the streets protesting. The protests are happening not just in uh, West Asia. The protests are happening in Latin America. Protests are happening in France. Protests are happening in, in the US, the Occupy Wall Street movement mm -hmm. after 2008. These protests are very, very real. And governance, policy making, has to find the right answers uh, to, to these kinds of protests. Because the technology divide, and it's, it's a very real divide. The technology divide is a divide which not just widens with every you know, uh, shifting year, it's a divide which actually deepens. Mm. It yeah. deepens with every passing phase of technology. And, and, and the technology wars which are now seeing happening between the major powers are basically a battle to position along the right place in the global value chains in, in the years of the future. So yes, there is going to be a contest between nations, countries which can fashion the right policies, the right governance tools, societies which can get the right responses and actually be able to bridge the, techno the, the digital divide within their own societies are going to prosper more. And now that is a real challenge for the developing world. How do you bridge a technology divide? The technology divide exists across gender. The technology divide exists across various sections of society. It, it exists between rural and urban. And as I said, the technology divide gets worse and worse every time there's a shift in technology. Every time we shift from 2G to 3G, it happens. When you're 3G, you shift to 5G, it is again going to happen. It's a simple matter of saying technology is empowering. Yes, technology empowers. Technology places power in everybody's hands. Uh, but the fact is, it depends on what kind of a smartphone you have in your hand. Ultimately, your access to health, uh, your access to education is going to depend on what kind of device you hold in your hands, what kind of service your area actually attains. Whether you are accessing it on a broadband connection, a satellite connection, or on a lumbering 2G, 3G connection. So there are challenges for the world, and how we face them is going to be interesting. I can talk, come in later about it. Thank you for that overview. That's, that's really important. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit further about not just that divide deepening, but the inequality as it, as, it, as it really kind of finds itself in the gender area. And I think what's actually interesting here at this panel, how the women are on the ends of the, the stage, uh, we're, we're in the power positions on the stage, right, Ms. Um, Fernandez de la Vega. And so I'd hope that you could give us some more insights into gender inequality and how technology can help patch that, if you will, if that's a good pun, um, to, to get us into the future and to you know, stabilize and create more opportunities, not just for technology to improve societies, but improve opportunities for women and other you know, minorities, ethnic minorities as well, if you could give us some more insights. Bueno, pues muchísimas gracias. Buenos días a todos por invitarme a participar en este estupendísimo um, coloquio uh, en esta mesa dedicada a abordar ni más ni menos que un tema tan relevante como tecnología, bienestar, desigualdad. No sé si ese orden está intencionado o no, pero es así aparece, tecnología, bienestar, desigualdad. Bien, de eso vamos a hablar ahora luego. Um, eh, yo creo que efectivamente es un tema candente, es un tema estratégico hoy, eh, estratégico especialmente para, para la sociedad, para, para los hombres y para las mujeres, pero de modo particular es un tema candente y muy importante para las mujeres. Las nuevas eh, tecnologías forman parte de nuestro presente y, y cada vez más forman parte de nuestro presente y van a estar, van a ser, son ya nuestro futuro y nos afectan a todo, a la vida personal, a la vida política, económica, a la vida social. Impregnan todo. Eh, por lo tanto, desde esa perspectiva, la importancia no puede ser mayor. La pregunta es, la primera pregunta que surge, a mí me surge, es ¿nos van a ayudar esas tecnologías que lo impregnan todo y que tienen tanta importancia a profundizar? ¿Nos van a, a ayudar a que haya más bienestar? Porque aquí ya sabemos que vivimos en un mundo fracturado de desigualdad, social y de desigualdad de género, nos van a ayudar a profundizar en la igualdad, nos van a ayudar a profundizar en la democracia, en este nuevo mundo que, está, que se está configurando alrededor de la red, de la red de redes. 
Porque el gran reto es, el gran reto es, que es saber si los valores como dignidad, humanismo, solidaridad, igualdad, que son los valores que sostienen los derechos humanos, que los derechos humanos han sido el avance mayor de la humanidad, han configurado el mayor avance de la humanidad, eh, van a, a transmitirse con, eh, con la misma inmediatez y calidad eh, a través de esa red de redes que otros temas. Es decir, si no tenemos los derechos humanos, si no tenemos todos esos valores que nos, que nos han hecho prosperar y llegar muy lejos, pues ya empezamos mal, ya empezamos a tener una gravísima preocupación. Y yo creo, sinceramente, que este es un planteamiento que hay que hacerse siempre, porque tenemos que garantizar que esos valores no los vamos a perder, o que van a aumentar, o que nos van, o nos van a mejorar, porque si no nos van a mejorar y nos van a impedir mejorar o vamos a seguir como estamos, vamos a tener mucha tecnología, muchos smartphones, muchos uh, aparatos, pero la desigualdad va a seguir estando ahí. Y yo creo sinceramente que somos las mujeres mmm, quienes estamos en mejores condiciones de garantizar que esos valores se transmiten a través de la red o de las redes, ¿Por qué? porque hemos sido las, las mejores aliadas de esos valores y seguimos siendo las mejores aliadas en todo el mundo, porque sabemos, ya se nos dijo desde que nacemos, se nos dice y se nos muestra a través ya de las tecnologías lo vemos, que para cuando tú tienes avanzar en conocimiento, avanzar en saber, avanzar en educación, te da la libertad. Entonces, sabemos que es muy importante ese avance y, y, y por tanto, queremos que, que lo que se ha avanzado no, 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 no suponga ningún retroceso en estos momentos que estamos viviendo. Y que, la, que cuando se habla de la palabra avance o tecnología, se estamos, estamos sabiendo que vamos por el camino de, de, de alcanzar la igualdad real, una, alcanzar, una igualdad que todavía no hemos alcanzado. Y, 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 por tanto, yo creo que pensar como sociedad en, en, que vamos a, eh, en que va a mejorar la sociedad sin contar con las mujeres es absolut, absolutamente inasumible. Hoy es inasumible. Es decir, eh, es, insosteni es inasumible y es insostenible. Y, por tanto, tenemos que dar nuevos pasos para, que, para acceder, pero para que eso se produzca, para que las mujeres podamos tener ese acceso de igualdad en el ámbito de la tecnología, tenemos que estar antes en otro ámbito, que es en la estructura del conocimiento, en la estructura de generación del conocimiento, no solo del conocimiento, porque la estructura de generación del conocimiento impregna las tecnologías y hace que lo que se transmite por esas tecnologías sea la misma estructura permanente hoy patriarcal. Es decir, los valores que, que circulan son los valores imperantes, que no son de igualdad, que son de desigualdad, que son de desigualdad real, porque tenemos una estructura todavía en donde las mujeres no participamos y hemos avanzado muy poco en la generación del conocimiento. Eh, yo me he molestado en mirar unas estadísticas y he visto que el, los, el avance que se ha producido desde el 2013 al 2017, en la participación de las mujeres en todo el mundo, en el avance del conocimiento, hemos pasado del 11%, de estar en el 11% a estar en el 11,6% en, en, en todos esos años. Pero si nos vamos ya… Eso en general, en la media del mundo. Pero si vemos los países desarrollados, el avance ha sido del de 29,9% 29, al… 32%, o sea, dos décimas, dos puntos. O sea, no hemos avanzado mucho en, la, en estar en la estructura del conocimiento. Y lo que está ocurriendo es que en el diseño y la utilización de las tecnologías se reproducen tópicos y esquemas eh, heredados de la estructura patriarcal. Es decir, se reproduce el modelo de la desigualdad. Esa es la pura realidad. Y, y por tanto, eh, se mantiene prácticamente intacto el modelo. No es un modelo que haya avanzado a integrar más las mujeres, en donde podamos in integrar los valores eh, que, que nosotras fundamenta fundamentalmente eh, transmitimos, mmm, sino que sigue el modelo de la dominación. Existe un nexo muy claro entre metodología tecnología, eh, tecnológica y contextos socioculturales. Es decir, la, la metodología tecnológica absorbe el modelo sociocultural que hay y lo reproduce y lo aumenta. Bueno, está muy bien que aumente, pero que aumente algo que, que en, en, el, en el origen, y, y aquí se estaban hablando, cuando se habla de desigualdades, es que hay algo en el origen que no funciona. 
y no está funcionando. Y esa es la preocupación mayor que en estos momentos tenemos. El sistema de generación del conocimiento está plagado de estereotipos, de estereotipos de género que nos excluyen a las mujeres de esos procesos. Y, y, en, y además las mujeres constituyen hoy un, un pequeño, una pequeña minoría en los, uh, en los puestos tecnológicos de mayor responsabilidad, como siempre. Y todos ustedes habrán utilizado en alguna ocasión, estoy segura, um, algunos ayudantes tecnológicos, ¿no? Pues eh, tenemos Siri, eh, tenemos eh, Alexa, Cortana o los asistentes de Google. Ahí están todos hechos, son chicas todo, ¿eh? eh unas ayudantes... Eh, eh, para que el conjunto, a las que el conjunto de expertos en tecnología construyen su personalidad, construyen esa personalidad tecnológica con el objetivo de dar al usuario mm, calidez humana. Está muy bien, ¿no? mm, pero es una cosa absolutamente femenina, es una cosa absolutamente propia de un modelo. Además, el modelo eh, que tienen no es un modelo… Los asistentes no son mujeres, mujeres genéricas, no, son joven, occidental… Y, y de un perfil con una personalidad y voz cálida para transmitir algo que agrade al oyente. Y esto ni es causal ni es gratuito. Eso es así. Y eso está pensado desde un modelo que ha hecho de lo masculino un valor preponderante y de lo femenino un valor subordinado. Un valor subordinado agradable, grato. La feminización de los asistentes de voz surge de un contexto claro de discriminación, de desigualdad, de género, clarísima, que se acrecienta en las empresas tecnológicas. Apple y Amazon están dirigidas por hombres, desde luego, no hay, y, y en las estructuras superiores no hay mujeres que transmitan los valores, por lo menos matizaríamos algunas cosas, seguro que matizaríamos, y si hubiera más mujeres las cosas cambiarían, que, que, y además… Han hecho una cosa que, que, hay que hay que descubrir, ¿no? Eh, han respaldado, eh, lo han hecho, este, este modelo de los asistentes y todo lo que se transmite eh, está hecho desde, con estudios, han generado unos estudios que dicen que los clientes eh, de, estos, de las tecnologías prefieren una voz femenina a una voz masculina. ¿eh? Eso lo han generado. Cuando hay estudios anteriores ya muy antiguos, en donde se dice que los oyentes, y estoy, estoy hablando de la telefonía, prefieren un, una voz distinta al género que poseen. Pero bueno, ya han inventado las tecnologías que haya unos estudios elaborados que digan que todos los oyentes prefieren una voz femenina. Bueno, pues no es así, pero bueno, está, eso es una, una prueba de cómo las tecnologías están transmitiendo exactamente el modelo. Entonces, a mí esto me produce una gran preocupación y creo que tenemos que reivindicar, sobre todo, que hay que llevar… La, es decir, que no puede haber bienestar sin igualdad y no puede haber progreso sin igualdad. Esto ya es una cosa que deberíamos todos saberla, pero la sabemos, pero todavía el modelo no lo… lo no hemos sido capaces de modificarle. Y si queremos de una vez por todas que en la historia de la revolución tecnológica no nos excluya… Tenemos que trabajar a fondo el mundo del conocimiento, el mundo del conocimiento, porque allí es donde se esconden los, pre, los mayores prejuicios, están ahí, están ahí asentados, y, y, y por lo menos para que no se amplíen y seamos conscientes de que, de, de que no podemos ampliarlos si utilizamos el mismo modelo de conocimiento que luego transmitimos masivamente a través de nuestras redes. En el conocimiento es donde empieza todo y no hay más que ver las estadísticas, eh, ahora hay muchas dificultades y tenemos un discurso muy poderoso de que tenemos que hacer que las niñas estudien más ciencia, estudien más tecnología. Está todo el modelo de, de todo el discurso de las STEM, que a mí me parece muy bien, porque es verdad, ahí están las cifras. No les digo más que eh, pueden ustedes, y, y se lo recomiendo, que miren las cifras de un trabajo extraordinario que ha hecho UNESCO, en donde pone descifrar, se llama el trabajo, la desigualdad que se está produciendo en el acceso a la tecnología. Entonces, los retos mmm, tienen que partir ya, los retos fundamentales es que tenemos que partir de una premisa que nunca se, se contempla, y es que las mujeres ya, además, nos hemos posicionado en otros terrenos eh, importantes, en algunos terrenos del conocimiento muy importantes, que a veces se infravaloran, como es el terreno de las ciencias sociales y de las humanidades. 
Ahí nos hemos posicionado. Ahí tenemos una posición ya de liderazgo. Y ello no solo es malo, sino que es muy bueno. Porque es verdad que hay que tener en cuenta que mientras se enseñan las tecnologías y se transmiten por las redes las propias tecnologías, hay que transmitir también los valores. ¿Por qué? Porque si tú a un niño le enseñas temas de tecnología, va efectivamente a estar mejor preparado para competir en el mundo, en el mundo de, para competir en el mundo de la economía. Pero no sé si va a estar lo suficientemente preparado, si no le seguimos formando también en humanidades y en ciencias sociales, para, para el pensamiento crítico, para la empatía y para la comprensión de la injusticia. Valores sin los cuales no se puede tener tampoco éxito en el mundo. Por tanto, ese es el reto. El reto es que estamos en una situación de desigualdad, de desigualdad profunda, que el modelo se transmite mmm, intacto a través de las tecnologías y que, por tanto, o hacemos una batalla para que esto cambie y cambie ya o vamos mal. Y vamos mal porque, además, no nos podemos permitir el desperdicio del capital inmenso que suponen las mujeres. Y les voy a dar algún ejemplo. África. Es evidente mmm, que yo soy una apasionada de África porque creo que África es un continente absolutamente maravilloso e inmenso del que tenemos tanto que aprender eh, que deberíamos eh, colocarnos ya en situación de, de escuchar, de escuchar, de mirar, de ver. Y es evidente que en África eh, son las mujeres su principal motor. Es el motor más importante de todo el continente. Son impresionantes. Bueno, pues ustedes saben que hay un montón de científicas impresionantes en África. Yo cuando propuse en mi país, en España, que tenemos unos niveles de ciencia bastante competitivos y avanzados, traer científicas africanas senior, titulares de procesos de investigación en todas las áreas del saber y del conocimiento, me decían... ¿Pero hay africanas investigadoras senior? Y digo, pues claro que las hay, muchas y muy buenas. Pues no las conocemos, digo, ese es el problema, que no las conocéis, ¿eh? porque mmm, ni los africanos las sacan ni nosotros las llamamos. Bueno, vamos a llamarlas, vamos a buscarlas y no se pueden ustedes imaginar las 70 africanas que han venido ya a España a, mmm, en investigadoras en áreas de investigación, además que están revolucionando en el mundo. Y que es importante que, que el resto de los científicos del mundo las conozcan. Y desde una joven, y estoy viendo aquí a la primera ministra, primera ministra de Senegal, amiga Aminata Touré, una científica a, africana, a, senegalesa, joven, que impactó, fue la, una de las primeras que impactó muchísimo porque su proyecto de investigación era investigar el impacto de eh, los monzones en el cambio climático a través de una fórmula matemática. Y vino a hacer un, una su beca, su de proyecto de investigación, a Madrid, al IGMAR, que es un instituto de matemáticas de gran prestigio internacional. Y mmm, decían, pero bueno, se la rifaron, porque es un crack. ¿eh? Eh, se, Aminata es un crack. ¿eh? Eh, y ha abierto un ámbito en la investigación relacionado con el cambio climático impresionante. Pero puedo mencionar a esta, puedo mencionar a una marroquí impresionante que tenemos ahora en, en España, recién llegada, que tiene, está haciendo un proyecto de investigación impresionante en relación con el, con el estudio de las algas y el impacto de las algas marroquíes, y además tiene no sé cuántos premios ya y doctorados de L'Oréal. En fin, o mujeres provenientes de países en conflicto, Sudán del Sur, una astrofísica, es decir, las mujeres se han se están, estamos entrando en el área del conocimiento, pero tenemos que estar más, porque todavía somos muy pocas, y todavía son pocas, y son pocas porque no tienen las oportunidades de estar. Así que, o hacemos que las tecnologías transmitan valores y nos coloquen en condiciones de igualdad en relación a las tecnologías y al conocimiento, o esto no va a ir bien. Yo no, yo soy optimista. Porque creo que lo, si, no, si no lo hacemos, lo haremos, porque vamos a tener que hacerlo las mujeres como sea. Porque no hay otra, no solo para las mujeres, sino para el conjunto de la humanidad. Porque hay un talento que no se puede desperdiciar y porque es una cuestión de justicia. Y aquí, en más que ningún otro sitio, o se tiene en cuenta que hay que restaurar la brecha de género que existe en todo el mundo 
o vamos muy mal. Y hay muchas posibilidades de poderla restaurar, porque hay una predisposición natural y una inteligencia natural y una inteligencia, además, social de las mujeres para poder estar y tener que estar donde todavía no estamos. Y queremos que el siglo XXI sea un siglo de paz. No habrá paz, no habrá progreso y no habrá bienestar. Entonces, hay que hablar de tecnología, igualdad y bienestar, porque si no hay igualdad no habrá bienestar. Y la igualdad tiene que ser lo primero. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Now, we have just two minutes left, and I want to use that two minutes wisely. So I'm going to ask the panel to think of, and thank you so much for those comments, the, the end note that I would like you each to consider is, what can the folks in this room do? Um, and, and you touched upon optimism and being optimistic about this conversation around technology, welfare, and inequality. So quickly, if the panelists could think of just 10 seconds of what the, the, the folks gathered in this room <coughs> can do as we move this conversation forward. And then with the other 30 seconds, I'm so interested to take one question, but that one question can only be a 10 second question and the answer can only be a 20 second response by one panelist. So quickly, one question. Yeah, my name is Mubarak, I'm from Senegal. You have talked about technology, but not innovation, uh, not sharing from uh, within Africa. So if you can proceed, I think if we have to benefit from technology also, innovation within Africa is important. Thank you. Innovation. Yes, um, I, I, I do a link between actually uh, innovation uh, and uh, technology. Uh, innovation comes from science and a lot of uh, thinking out of the box. So in, uh, in Africa, innovation is not only in technology. Innovation is just in organization also. Innovation is uh, also today showing as a way of banking, for instance, uh, as a way of doing politics. So uh, in Africa, I, to, in my opinion, research center and innovation are what is missing, also what is lacking. Uh, I was just mentioning that the area where Africa is really lacking behind is on, on, on research, on science, on innovation and technology. And uh, that's the reason why, uh, for me, if you want to grow in uh, the field of petrol and gas knowledge, uh, in the, if you want to grow in the field of medicine, of agriculture, of uh, industry, there's no other way than innovation, than uh, technology, than also uh, science uh, mastering. And I would like uh, just to give an example of uh, the, uh, the effect of lack of innovation and lack of technology. Senegal has just discovered gas and petrol, you know about this. Today, we don't have the means for research and development on the petrol exploration. We have to bring in BP from uh, UK, Exxon, uh, <coughs> and, and this is really a typical example why uh, the Western world and the African uh, world, uh, where we have really a, a, a big gap of inequality now. This is a scientific and technological in inequality, and we must solve this. But Africa will not expect that uh, the Western world help her to, to do that. Africa must do that itself. We must make sure that we must how to uh, do research on, on petrol and gas, how to do research on new seed, how to do research on drones and so on, how to manufacture cars, uh, planes and so on. That's what China did. So I, I really love the, the, that, uh, the, the fact that here we are really pointing out the real issues. And what I just wanted to uh, uh, ask everybody from this room to think about is how we, can we impact that? How can we impact the, the mastering of technology, of innovation, of science, in, in Africa, in Latin America, in, in Asia, I would say in the developing world. And we know, we all yes. know the solution, uh, but we just need now policymakers, university people, uh, the ministers and so on. We need to make sure that we enforce that. So just with a few moments left, Ms. Fernandez de la Vega, how, what can we move yo, this conversation forward? No, yo, yo voy a, a, a señalar que para innovación las mujeres, también se lo digo, y las africanas, fíjese usted, yo le puedo decir que uno de los, de los temas más importantes para poder seleccionar a una africana científica para que venga es si su proyecto es innovador. Pues bueno, los proyectos de las científicas africanas son muy innovadores. Tienen como característica fundamental la innovación, entre otras cosas porque son, en general, investigaciones eh, que se plantean 
eh, en, con, en, es decir, lo hacen con temas, eh, es decir, abordan los temas de la investigación eh, enfrentándose a problemas globales con medios y productos locales y, además, en procesos internacionales. Fíjese usted qué complicado. Pues eso lo hacen las científicas africanas. Están planteando problemas que son, desde un punto de vista científico, de la comunidad global, pero buscan soluciones, a veces en su propio país, con temas locales, con algas locales, con temas locales, pero con un método internacional, el método contrastado internacionalmente en el ámbito de la investigación. Porque usted sabe que en el ámbito de investigación hay un método, métodos específicos que son rigurosamente hay que seguir para poder ser competitivo. Bueno, pues eso lo hacen las investigadoras africanas. Llámelas usted en su país, llámelas en África, porque las tiene muchísimas. Las que están y las que todavía no están, que si las apoyamos van a estar. Porque hay muchas más que no podemos ni siquiera en mi propia organización atender, no porque no las haya. En el último concurso que hemos hecho se han presentado 200 currículum para 15 plazas, 200 currículos impresionantes. Ayúdenme los africanos a cuidar a las mujeres africanas científicas. Yo sé que las cuidan, pero más, porque tenemos que hacer más todos ahí. Thank you. Mr. Josie, a few moments, a few wrap-up words to share with the group. Yeah. On the question of innovation, technology fundamentally empowers, it enables. How does it empower and enable? Uh, no, we have, I was having this very interesting conversation with the innovation labs working out of IIT Mumbai, which fundamentally allow, build a, they built a platform which allow young innovators to come in and create their own applications and services. And the amazing thing which they found was that the most winning applications, which won the best prizes, did not come from the best institutions in the country. They did not come from <coughs> the institutes of technology. They came from small town polytechnics. Now, there is a lot of skill, there's a lot of talent, which has not been recognized by our current educational systems because they are still stuck in the hierarchies of power of information. Now, what technology does, it disrupts that hierarchy of information. It, it universalizes information. Now, that is the power of technology. So, My last message to everyone in this room, you asked me what, what, what we should be thinking of, don't ever be dismissive. Be open, and next time we have this conversation, <coughs> let us get some 25-year-olds on this side of the panel and listen to them. Thank you. Mr. Bakarov, last thought? Uh, on innovation, I'll just <coughs> propose an innovative way to think about thinking. Uh, it may seem that we have disagreement, and obviously technology is so powerful, that it will lead to anxieties, disagreement, possibilities for some, and uh, inequalities, and so on. So what I would like you to invite you is to think, like when I express my own view, what was I saying? I wasn't talking about my views. There's no such thing. I was positioning myself on a space, the social space where thinking takes place. Thinking is essentially a social phenomenon. And I was just using myself, or use as an instrument to express views on behalf of the group. So as you see, when you approach thinking as a social phenomenon, and each can position himself or herself on different parts of that space, and of course we can position one time in a space and another part we can be in another space, moving, for example, from negative views to positive views, from pessimism or anxiety to optimism. As we position like this, we, there will be and decreased propensity for conflict, decreased propensity for feeling, I own that view, therefore I need to defend it. So I'll conclude that I don't have a view, and I shouldn't have a view, because that's narcissistic withdrawal. I was only speaking on behalf of the group and offering a position that we all own. And I own everything that was said because we're part of a group, and it's a group that we're going to affront and deal with technology. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you for coming. And thank you all for participating. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we take a quick group photo? Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, photo? thank you for your participation this morning. We will now break for lunch and reconvene at 2.30. Please enjoy your meal. <laughs>